So, Mark, at the moment, uh, am I right in saying that this is the last date on the European tour? It is, yeah. We uh, we play at the Milkbeg uh, tonight. And let's see, it's seven countries, um, 12 official shows, plus we did a live recording for the BBC in London. So we recorded three songs. We did a special show outside of London in a church. Um, and I did a performance in Stockholm. So really, all in all, plus all the interviews, I think we've done uh, 15 shows in 20 days. All right. So it, it's, been, it's been the most grueling tour as far as energy exertion goes. But I will say that this has been the greatest tour that I've ever experienced. Um, the shows have been incredible. The band is, you know, after playing so many shows on the road and sharing a bus together, the band is just, you know, we're, we're in the pocket. We're kind of just a hot shit band right now. So, <laughs> and then you have the, the, in some cases, almost four years of anticipation to coming out here. People have been, I, I've, I've met a few people that have had their tickets since 2019. Right. We started planning this in, uh, in late 2018. So, with the anticipation and then with the timing of the new album and the new single, John Party, and, you know, playing Stagecoach right before we left here, it just feels like we're riding this huge wave of momentum. And it's, it's been really fulfilling to come overseas and play all these sold out shows for, you know, fans in, in seven different countries. So, um, yeah, it feels like all the, the time we spent coming to Europe before is kind of starting to really pay off now with building the fan base out here. Oh, that's very good to hear. And uh, as you mentioned, it must be great after a number of years of, of kind of a lot of doubt whether whether this would even be possible again. Uh, that must be great to, to... Well, as a group, did you ever have that, uh, have that doubt of, of, okay, what's going to happen to this band? How are, are we going to proceed into the future? Because once a, something like a pandemic hits, that, that does take a toll on you, I suppose, at some point. Yeah, I, I think it was... Uh, I think it was... It was extremely unsettling for everybody sure. um, in the whole world because you just nobody really knew. Um, there was nothing that was guaranteed. Um, it seemed like it, that year and a half really to me felt more like probably five years. Mm. I feel like so much changed, and there was those moments of a panic because we had, you know, I'd worked my whole career to get to the place that we were in 20 in 2019 in the beginning of 2020 you know the last show we played before the pandemic was in front of 80,000 people headlining wow. at the houston rodeo and i just had a kid and you know i had just purchased my first house and i had you know between me just and cameron we had uh 12 full-time employees and you know there was the responsibility of of keeping everybody in my band and the organization um, employed, which we did uh, with a lot of acts that were much bigger than us and have way more money. Um, they let their whole crews go, which I thought was really chicken shit. Um, so, you know, if we, for a minute, we probably panicked, but then we made the most of it. We got to writing and we wrote this entire album and, and recorded it so that we would have something to really build back to um, once we came back full swing. And, and, and that's why we timed it. And we have such an amazing management group who, you know, Matt Graham and Range and, and Todd Ramey and, and Jason Owen, um, we were really able to formulate like just such a, a great plan to create and to keep our fans engaged and release the Sonic Ranch and the documentary mm -hmm. and, um, and, and make the most of that time off because we were also really exhausted. <laughs> we had been touring nonstop. So once you got past the initial freak out and you knew that eventually we would return, you just, it was just a, a game of patience. And once I realized that I wasn't going to become, you know, homeless <laughs> or have to start driving Ubers right. um, to, to support my family, then I really, really enjoyed the time off. And then, it was an adjustment to get back into <laughs> my work schedule. But now here we are three weeks into this tour and um, 
you know, I'm exhausted in the best possible way. I'm really excited to go home to my family because, you know, there's something very triumphant about um, returning with, you know, with just 12 extremely successful shows and thousands and thousands of Europeans that are deeply satisfied after years and years of waiting and hanging on to their tickets and um, sticking with us through the pandemic. Um, you know, the, the feedback that I've gotten from fans on social media and then, you know, live and meeting people on the streets and after the show signing autographs, you know, it, it's meant a lot to them um, that we came over here and, and brought this music. And it's a really fascinating thing to see how our music, which is a very American sure. um, genre, you know, the country music, but I think that we embody more than just uh, the American country. Uh, I think it, it's, it's much broader and it really conveys the human experience, which, which I hope, and it, it probably fantasizes um, the West a little bit and maybe the iconography of the cowboy. But at the end of the day, these are songs about uh, heart, heartbreak. These are songs of hope. Um, they're songs of escapism, um, <laughs> of irreverence, and uh, of healing. So it, it's great to see how it translates across cultures and languages. And, um, you know, it's, that's, that's the goal is to be an international band mm. um, and have as many people uh, listen to it and know it like our heroes, like, you know, the Eagles or the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or Bruce Springsteen. You know, Bruce is singing a, a a very American brand of music, but it translates globally, you know? Sure. Just like how you two was singing songs that were really deeply kind of Irish, you know? <laughs> sure. And it translated it beautifully um, across, uh, across the globe. So, sorry, I'm rambling on, man. No, 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 no got, that's uh, perfect. I just, got, I just got out of the gym and I took like a bunch <laughs> of uh, uppers. So I'm like, I'm like, jazz. No, but you, you mentioned, you went into a couple of things I wanted to kind of follow up on because it is interesting, uh, the fact that people can find something in, in music that isn't uh, isn't necessarily made or about where they're from. And right. especially with country music, the, re the way I kind of came into it or, or, or started listening to it a lot was the stories. The, the stories were always, there. there's a, a sense of honesty in those stories, a sense of realism in those stories. And... Uh, you mentioned having more time this time around because of the pandemic. So did you kind of, how did that affect the writing? Well, did you kind of deep uh, or, uh, jump in deeper in terms of storytelling and in terms of what you wanted to kind of convey in these songs? Yeah. I mean, I think because of the circumstances um, that we were writing under, there was this overall kind of, um, I think yearning and, and uh, kind of nostalgia, if mm. you will. And I think because we had more time, I think that we ended up really pushing the boundaries of, of, of what Midland can be as far as really diving into our influences. And I feel like this album is really kind of a soundtrack, like an homage to all of our influences. Um, so I, I do think it's very dynamic and, and very broad um in the spectrum of the sounds and the tones and uh in the styles you know we've got a, a waltz like sunrise tells a story which is unlike anything we've done we've got a song with Bear Me and blue jeans which to me is is kind of rock and roll soul you know it's got like an r d rhythmic thing going to it um reminds me of almost like stevie wonder and, and some of the tone and the tones we actually were we're uh, using the, the clavicle, which is what Stevie Wonder used in like Superstitious. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, songs like Long Neck Way to Go are, are, are clearly a, a tip of the hat to like Jackson Brown um, and the Eagles with the harmonies on it. And um, yeah, I, I, I think it allowed us to ruminate a little bit on on the kind of songs and we wrote a ton of music there's a there's a actually three of my favorite songs didn't even make it on the album <laughs> from this from this uh from this writing and i hope we get to record those because you know we're democratic and three of us vote on what we wanted and i'm very thankful that sometimes i don't get my way because to be honest with you when we work taped long neck way to go 
I didn't like it. And same thing when we work taped uh, Bury Me in Blue Jeans after we wrote the songs. I was like, you know, they're cool, but they just don't feel, I didn't have a connection to them until we got into the studio. And we were able to flush those songs out, which is always the process. I really fell in love with them. And, um, you know, they've become two of my favorite songs. Long Neck might be the most um, accessible and catchy song, including Drinking Problem that we've ever written. You know, it's kind of, it's starting to feel like Drinking Problem again, where that song is just, uh, it's feeling huge. So I hope I answered your question, man. No, I'm, no, uh, certainly. I'm all over the place. I'm sitting in Amsterdam <laughs> on my balcony and um, it's warm outside for the first time and people are out there eating lunch and drinking wine and smoking spliffs and uh, <laughs> enjoying and themselves. It's, 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 it's very beautiful. Yeah. Right. And the canal boats are going by. This is uh, such a beautiful city. Might be the most beautiful city between here and Vienna that I've ever been. And I will admit, since I've moved uh, out of Amsterdam, I do miss it at times. Yeah, it's such a, there's so much energy here, man. Um, and, uh, and, and everybody's been really welcoming. Uh, I don't, I have been walking around. I gave my cowboy hat to a, uh, to a kid in um, Manchester or, or Sheffield, Sheffield, I think, in the UK. So I don't have a cowboy hat. So I haven't been getting as, as much attention, but that's funny. There's a train going by that has uh, a fashion shoot that was shot. It looks like in my hometown it's called Saguaro Cactuses. <laughs> Where I live. <laughs> well, but you mentioned, or you alluded to something interesting, the, the aesthetic of, of what you do. How important is that for the three of you? Now, how much uh, emphasis do you place on it? Uh, not a lot, to be honest okay. with you. I mean, I, you know, I think, I think it gets overhyped. You know, for okay. an album cover, when you're when you're shooting the assets for an album, um, you know, I think you kind of do that. But you know, when we when we came out of the blocks in 2016, obviously we had a lot of success with our debut album, and and Drinking Problem is you know three times platinum now, and we got nominated for Grammys. And sure, um, when we came out six years ago, it was there was. Um, it was rare to see a mainstream guys wearing nudie suits and, and cowboy hats and, you know, cool looking cowboy boots. Um, that was like, that was just us expressing ourselves, which I think we've always done. Um, we're all just into design and okay. we all get a kick out of fashion, but like I'm less and less, uh, you know, I feel like everybody now is, has, has, Throwing on Wranglers and cowboy boots, and <laughs> I'm less and less like uh, worried about having that aesthetic because um, I, I never want to be anchored to one thing. You know, so it was about exploring. And, and my favorite artist, um, you know, the Beatles didn't just stick to wearing their their uh, their double breasted, you know, iconic gray gray suits with turtlenecks and bob cuts. You know. Um, so yeah, I think it's always about like exploring and, and changing. I mean, I changed my fucking look all the time. Dude. <laughs> Fair enough. I had a beard growing and then I just shaped it into a mustache and dyed my hair and I grew it long <laughs> and grew it short. And sometimes I wear plots of pants and sometimes I wear, you know, I don't know. I'm always switching up, but people get, you know, I think we're good dressers. I think we just have a, a unique sense of, of self and, and we're not afraid to express ourselves. And I think a lot of people either don't think about it or just don't kind of have that, their brains don't kind of work that way. So obviously we didn't get enough attention as children. So we dress flashy so people pay attention. To us. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. No, 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 I saw a lot of, uh, when I was doing my research, I saw uh, some, some reference to that. And I was wondering what it was like from your perspective. And then, there's another thing that kind of, I, I came across in my research and maybe, I, I don't know if this is a good kind of, thing to focus on that encompasses the album but i went on the uh insolito website the, the tequila that you make yeah and there's uh kind of a reference to robert frost uh wrote not taken but to, to get to new places you have to make your own path and I, I thought that phrase on the website that fit the band very well as well so yeah the the, the tequila uh, you know me jess and cameron created the tequila from the ground up um, and it's an extension of our bands. It's an extension of our creativity and I guess our kind of mantras or 
are um, our, our our kind of artists' mo, like uh, operating kind of uh, agreements, and yeah, it is. is the, the name itself means insolito means rare, uncommon, extraordinary, and I think if you're going to make anything, it should be different. It should stand out. It shouldn't just be like the rest of the stuff. And I think we came out with something that was very, uh, I guess, post-modern traditional. And, and that was like really weird or, or exciting and kind of uh, rare when we, when we made that music. And now I feel like a lot of artists have chased our sound, whether they admit it or not. And, you know, I think that's why this album is, is, a, is more of an exploration from that. But it's the same with the tequila where it's colorful, it's vibrant, but it's really, it, it, it's very tasty. You know, <laughs> it's very good stuff. It's high quality. The bottle looks fantastic. Um, and it's authentic. You know, we, we worked with Alberto Herrera, the Herrera brothers. You know, Alberto is a master distiller in a really beautiful distillery. It's up in the Sierra de la Tigre Mountains, um, about a three and a half hour drive uh, out of Guadalajara. And, you know, Alberto's family has been, mescaleros for six decades 60 years and you know we just got a uh, a no uh, non-additive uh, certification meaning that it's completely pure it's completely natural um from the ground up from the moment the agaves are grown wildly with no with no fertilizer they're not grown with any kind of insecticides um and you know we we make it uh, the old the old way um, and the tequila is amazing. We've won two gold medals. And I think in the market, as far as like a, 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 a widely produced um, tequila, I think it's, it literally is the best tequila for its price point. So that's really exciting for us. And, uh, you know, I think we're interested in doing more than just making music. You know, um, Cameron has, has written and co uh, created a couple of shows and, and wrote a Jess and him created a script together. Even though I helped input a lot of it, I didn't get a, and inspired a lot of it. I didn't get a co-creating, co-writing. Um, but it's a movie that I'm gonna I'm gonna co-star in, and we're gonna shoot it next year. Cameron's gonna direct it. Um, you know, and I, I do I do acting, and you know, we all write. And you know, Cameron helped produce our friend and write a uh, friend's uh, album for uh, uh, sure who's on our record label. We have our own imprint. And uh, our buddy, Jonathan Terrell, who's out on the road with us, you know, I've sang on some of his tracks and Cam and Jess have written some of his songs. I just wrote a, a title track to a movie with, I uh, co-wrote it with uh, Rita Wilson, with uh, Tom Hanks' wife, um, for a movie that she's co-starring in. And I got to produce that. And that'll be coming out later in, in the year. And, yeah, you know, the idea is just to, to stay busy and to make, in the States, we say, make hay while the sun shines, you know, <laughs> make the most of your opportunity. So that, that's what we're doing. And that's what this tour has been all about. And I think that this album is going to be our, our most successful album to date, which is really great to have your fourth album, you know, continuing with the momentum like that. So I think if we stay focused and, you know, we don't, uh, we don't wring each other's necks. Um, you know, I think we have a, we've got a really promising future because I feel like in a way we were kind of restarting after COVID. Yeah, but as you say, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you do have this vision of being uh, this big international band. So so the decisions that you make, um, and this is kind of what I alluded to with that quote, but when you take the, make those decisions like, oh, I'm going to star in this movie or... or we have all these other things that we're going to focus on, not just the music, but we have all these ideas. Do they feel like risks or have you always been collectively or you individually been very adventurous people? Uh, yeah, I think the latter, you know, I think we're, I think we're risk takers. I think we have to be um, to, to do what we did. Um, and, and, you know, I think we just essentially at the end of the day, we have a really strong work ethic. Thanks to our parents. Um, so it's one thing to have an idea or to have a skill. Um, it's another thing to execute it and to have follow through because um, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's really difficult. You know, like a lot of kids are like, what, what's your advice? I'm like, well, 
you you better prepare to be very honest with yourself um, and push yourself, not accept mediocrity. And you better be willing to work harder than anybody else and have that kind of discipline. It's like being a professional athlete. Mm. And it's not easy on the road. There's so many... Um, there, there's so many uh, kind of hazards, you know, it's, it's easy to get into, get lost in, in drinking or drugs and stuff like that. So you have to be really disciplined and, um, and, and just be willing to work. So thankfully, you know, we, when we try something and we do it like with Insolito or with a film, we throw our complete effort into it. And if you give it everything you got, you can't be afraid to fail. Like some things are, are going to work and some things aren't. So, that's fine. No, I don't. I, I'm more worried about having regret than having a list of failures because I've I've failed plenty of times. I've I've been up. I've been all the way at the bottom, and I've been back up again. So now it's just it's just about uh, I don't know, being uh, choosing the right things. This notion of I don't know if this ties into that, but this notion of the the last resort, and obviously there's a there's a wordplay in the song as well. But the, this notion of the the way I read it, and I don't know if this is right, but it's kind of almost like letting go of of, of having uh, making a decision and sticking with it. So like, okay, this is all I have, so I'm going to go all in. It's about accepting your fate. Mm. You know, it's about uh, it's about when God gives you lemons, uh, making margaritas. You know, that's the idea. So yeah, the last resort is, is it, it might not be the classically perceived um, dream destination, but it's good enough, you know, and you're going to enjoy it. Um, and, you know, whether you got there and, and the, your dreams didn't work out, you know, you're, you're still going to, you're going to make a dream out of, uh, out, of a, out of a tough situation, I guess, it is. It's like uh, it's dreaming with your eyes open and your heart broken. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, final question, then uh, I'm going to let you go and enjoy the city. But um, in terms of, you, you said this this album is probably uh, going to the biggest or hopefully going to be the biggest album you've done so far. How do you look towards the future? Because as I mentioned, you guys are very am ambitious, I think. So how do you look towards now that the world is... is having some sense of normalcy again, how do you look towards what you want to do now? Because you had some time to think about it as well. I mean, you know, we've got our, we've got our, our, you know, the next three years are, are pretty much planned out, but I, okay. I really don't, I don't, I try not to look, really look too far. I'm honestly like, it, it's too overwhelming. I, I literally just take things um, a day at a time. I really okay. do live in the moment. I don't, I don't really look backwards very often. Um, you know, I'm not a, I'll get nostalgic, but I don't spend a lot of time thinking about my past. Okay. Uh, I, I really am interested in, in, in the moment. Um, and if you, if you think too far, uh, too far ahead, you, you miss everything that's in front of you and it's too overwhelming, you know? Um, so I just enjoy the moment and, you know, it's basically, I'm, I'm trying to give the fans the, the greatest show of their life every night. And, you know, I'm trying to keep my wife and, and kids happy and, um, you know, just live in the moment. And so it, it's not, uh, I don't think too far ahead, but, you know, I, I do think that Midland will outlast, outlast a lot of our contemporaries who might have had more success because they have more radio, country radio play. Um, but I think we've made four outstanding albums that will stand the best of time. And even if we were to never release anything else, I think these albums will, will speak for themselves and continue to uh, continue to age like a fine wine. And um, we've got two more albums on this record deal. And, you know, we'll, 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 we'll start writing this summer for the new album and we'll start having a conversation about um, the shape and direction of it all. And um, yeah, but you know, just try to take it one day at a time. Right now, I'm focused on the last show of this tour, and uh, and and uh, then getting home and getting some rest for a week before I've got to go to Nashville for CMA Fest. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, one and day at a time, man. 
who knows? Maybe uh, those three songs will make it on the next record then. I I hope so, man. But, you know, I've also, the idea is that you learn something from every every album. And I, I did really learn that sometimes, you know, I don't always have to be right. Um, and sometimes I'm, I'm not always right. So that's the fun thing about, it's the challenging part about creating by coalition, being in a band, but it's also the rewarding thing is sometimes you arrive at something that, you know, you wouldn't have arrived, uh, arrived with um, on your own. So, yeah, we're, we're, think, we're operating on a high level right now, I would say. Yeah, fair enough. I, I think that realization of uh, realizing that you're not always right and you don't have to be right all, all the time is, is something the whole world could use at times. Yeah, um, especially our country, man, on, uh, <laughs> on, on both sides of the uh, political spectrum. And, no, but you know, it's, it's, it's stop now, being an expert. Yeah, but now it's it's a little bit highlighted uh, the U.S. of course, but it's everywhere that that, that kind of uh, thought process. So it's uh, we could learn from that. But what, one last thought then, because um, today's the last show of this this European tour. Are, is the band going to play as good as they uh, as it can? Because it's kind of the the final show. Because yeah, you've... we 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 have the most fun when we are performing at the highest level. That's what's fun. It's not fun to go. There's no. There's no point. You got to be on stage for 90 minutes, mm -hmm. and you know every. There are no small shows. Every show is super important because you know there's going to be 1,600 people or so here tonight, um, and you know to me it's it's super important that that they have that they walk away and go tell everybody that they know that it was the best show of their life. You know, if they tell three people, then Uh, each one of those people tells three people, then they'll tell three people, and you know that makes that's how you make the most out of out of an opportunity. You know? Fair enough, Mark. May I thank yeah. you for taking the time to talk with me? Hey, Robin, thank you, and uh, thank you to all of our listeners um, in Holland. And um, uh, is it is it thank you then? How do you say thank you? Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, Robin, <laughs> and we'll see you guys soon. Right. <laughs>